All right, guys, we are back with Mac Murdoch. Um, I've known this guy for quite some time now. Uh, originally, how I met him was just some random person came into the store and started asking me a lot of questions. And I kind of just took pity on him almost and said, you know what? I'll give this guy the benefit of the doubt. He sounds like a nice guy. So let's, you know, let's see what this guy can come up with. And I'm not kidding you. I was like that small all of a sudden realizing that, okay, this guy does way more than what I do. So Mac, yeah. give us a little bit of history about yourself because dude, you've had a long ass life in terms of things that you've done. <laughs> yeah, I've, I kind of, I've gone my life jumping from one thing to another, to another. And, uh, it's it's been it's been a wild ride for sure, and I don't know if you know, but you actually sold me my very first telescope too. Yes, I, I remember that. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so, hey everybody, um, my name's Mac Mac Murdoch, and uh, a little thing about myself, which I, it's in the presentation I'm about to show you, but I'll give you kind of a little other kind of rundown. Um, so I'm from Los Angeles. And I started, I, my first kind of real love was in music. So I went to music school. I got my degree in, in uh, classical music composition and film scoring so I could write for orchestras. And literally the year after, I was like, that was a mistake. And went into something else. I went into stunts and parkour. And then I did, you start getting injured enough times and you're like, what doesn't get you injured? And then it just so happened that one day, which I'll explain how this happened, how this day came, um, I got into photography. And yeah, here I am. So a lot of uh, people are starting to join in. I've got uh, uh, Raffle C. Wick says hello. Yes. Dustin okay. Haskins also says hello as well. Hey, everybody. So yeah. I can't see the comments, so you'll have to like tune them in every here and there. Oh yeah, don't worry. I, I will annoy the crap out of you. Now, this is going to be a little bit more informal in terms of us bouncing backwards and forwards because, like really? I said, I've known Mac long enough now, so I know how to mess with him, yeah. which is always going to be fun. Go so, for it. Yeah, feel free at any point to interrupt the presentation, ask your questions, do what you got to do. We got 56 or some odd slides to go through. Oh yeah, and this is not only just one hour long, we can go on forever. Uh, and you know what, what, what we'll do is after the presentation, we'll talk about a project that we've got coming up on Monday the 27th, okay? Oh. So don't give it away. Yeah, I'm excited, let's do it. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that in just one moment. So Mac, take it away, let's do your presentation. Cool, let's do it. Uh, so um, I, I wish I had some cool like Death Star music playing as Mac Murdoch presents Painting with Light. Yeah, maybe next time. Yeah. All right. So first, uh, I'll give you like a little insight about me. Then we'll go into what is light painting. A lot of people don't actually know what light painting is. Uh, the extent that they do know is you grab a little light and you write your name, which is light painting. But we're going to go a little more into depth. Uh, I'll talk about my light painting tools that I use, tell you where, where to get them if you want, um, and then how to expose your image. Just like this photograph right here, how do I expose the Milky Way and your light painting all in the same exposure? Uh, and then I'll give away some cool, unique tricks and techniques and stuff, and then we'll get into the real crazy part of it, fire and steel wool. And then we'll just take a bunch of questions, but we'll take questions throughout the way. So a little bit about me is, I'm, again, I'm from Los Angeles, California. Uh, I bought my very first camera in November in 2016. I'll tell you the story about that when, when this is done. Um, space has always fascinated me since I was a young child. I used to go camping all the time and I was the one that never went to bed at night and I'd literally just stay up and uh, stare at the sky. <laughs> um, so uh, I work three jobs. I'm a production assistant at Universal Studios. I manage social media and I'm also a stilt walker. 
uh, I just quit last year, but I was doing uh, indoor skydiving for a little while. I worked at a place there. That was pretty fun. Uh, I specialize in long exposures, specifically in astrophotography and light painting. I'm definitely my own worst critic. And over time, I've, it's one of those things that I've, I'll create an image and I'll find all the flaws with it. And I'll try and correct as many as I can and more flaws will come up. And then I'm at some point, I just gotta be like, all right, here you go world, enjoy it. So that's been kind of the biggest overcome of being a photographer that I've had to go through. And then here's how I actually got into photography. Um, I met a guy named Chris Bauer at a concert. Never met him before, never spoke to him before. We were, uh, it, the concert, it's, it was a, a looper. So he beatboxed, he looped it, put some stuff on top. And uh, he, so I met him right before the show actually started. And I it was like, so what do you do? And he's like, I'm a light painter. And I was like, what the hell is light painting? <laughs> I was like, people do this as a living. And uh, so I kind of thought it was a joke at first. And then he adds me on Facebook. And what I'll show you in the next slide is literally what I saw that changed everything. It was the image that I was like, oh my God, I want to do that. This, this is where my life needs to be. And there it is. Um, so uh, yeah, this is this is the the shot that changed that changed everything for me. Uh, and here's a little what I do, a little of my of my work, so you guys can see that there's not somebody on the screen talking about things he doesn't know. Uh, I do lunar photography of the moon. Uh, I do some deep space. So we got the rosette, Andromeda, horse head, and then a recent picture of the sun, which. My buddy Simon, right here. Um, I love how I'm putting my mouse over you, but I don't think anyone can see it. No, nobody can actually see you where I am. And the screen that I see and what they see are completely different, so you can't <laughs> mess with me on that one. All right. Well, yeah. Well, anyways, this is uh, this Simon definitely helped me with that one, and then I also do light painting, and I'll go over to on how these shots were actually created, kind of a step by step, and I've got some cool videos as well to show you. And I also do Milky Way landscapes. Um, yeah. So what is light painting? Light painting is light, painting with light. It's such a weird thing to explain because it's, it's pretty self-explanatory, but at the same time, it seems, it sounds and seems complicated when you actually look at it. Uh, light painting is the art of painting with light on a canvas of darkness using various tools and techniques to change your textures. Uh, I always say, close your eyes and imagine this. You have to, you're in a room and you have to paint Van Gogh's Starry Night. And you have all your paint brushes laid out. You've got your, your easel and everything laid out. But the deal is, is the light gets turned off. You are now in pitch black. You cannot see which color brush it is. You cannot see exactly where you're drawing. You are literally painting in pitch black. You cannot go over the same lines as you, uh, you've already drawn. And finally, when you are done painting this whole thing, you say done and the light turns on and you finally see what your image looks like. You can't change it, you can't edit it. This is how it is. And that's essentially light painting. You, you're painting on a canvas of darkness. All right, let's go over to some tools. There's so many more than what I'm about to show you, but I kind of condensed it down. And also a lot of tools are actually, you know, do it yourself, make it at home, figure it out kind of tools. It's not a big industry. So the main thing is finger, finger lights and flashlights. This is my first tool that I ever had. It was literally just a finger light and a flashlight. Uh, in fact, it wasn't even a finger light. It was one of those little mini LED key rings that you, that you can use. Um, and it's the perfect tool for if you're trying to draw or outline something. I'll teach you guys later how to make a light man. Um, which you'll actually see, I believe, on the next slide. And this is, this is the tools of how to make it. 
And also you can use a flashlight to expose yourself or something else in multiple places around a single exposure. So here are some examples. Here's a light man right over here. You can see the mouse, right? Yeah, we can, we can see the mouse. Okay, cool. So yeah, so here's a light man over here. I literally just take a light and you're tracing yourself the whole time. Uh, we'll get into details on things that you should know when doing that. This is what I was talking about when you can copy things, copy yourself. You Here you flash the, the flashlight at yourself, you exposed yourself, and then you moved to a different location and you exposed for yourself again. This is all, these are all single exposures. Um, there's the Milky Way over there. And then over here, it's kind of the same thing. So you are taking an LED and you are literally moving it back and forth, back and forth over yourself. And whatever the light does not hit will not get exposed. So as I'm doing my feet, I'm actually sitting upright, but there's no light actually hitting me to expose me. Hence why I don't look like I'm sitting upright. Uh, the universal connector. This is probably the most versatile tool in all of light painting. This is it right here. Uh, you can see it on the screen uh, in, the, in the middle. And uh, it allows you to connect your flashlight to multiple tools uh, or your own DIYs. Um, the universal connector plus, a water, plus water bottles even, as you can see on the right over here. Uh, plus colored gels are the most versatile thing. So you can have, let's say your tool here and you actually just pop off one of the tools that you have. And you can grab a different tool, water bottle, put it on, turn it on, and there you go. And you just keep swapping from one thing to another. Is this something that you bought or is this something that you made? So this is bought from a company called lightpaintingbrushes.com. Uh, yeah. So a lot of the tools that you'll see here are actually from lightpaintingbrushes.com. Uh, I have literally been with them ever since I started. I'm not with them like sponsored or anything, but I've just been using their products uh, since the very beginning. I, I stand by them completely. Um, but even if you take a water bottle, put a colored gel inside, let's say you put some red and some yellow and you start painting with it, it, lo it gives like a good fire kind of look to it. So you can just have fun and be creative. The next are uh, plexiglass cutouts and fiber optics. Um, so the plexiglass cutouts, they come in a bunch of different shapes and sizes. Here is a feather tool. I've got like a, odd whatever kind of shape this is tool. We've got a rectangle and a bunch of different others. And you basically, what happens is, is the middle of it doesn't actually light up. It's only the edges here that light up. So if you turn it on and turn it off, you now have an imprint on your image of a light painting of a rectangle. I'll show you guys some good instances of when this, this happens. Then you have here, you have uh, your black fiber optics over here. The thing about the black fiber optics is they give a very rough and scratchy texture because what happens is, is there's no light actually being shown on the fiber optic itself. You see it at the very end on the tips over here. So it's, you're only seeing the small lights that are, that are going across. Unlike the white fiber optic over here, where it illuminates the whole thing. So you have a bunch of different light. And as if you can see, there's little, uh, there's little balls on it that light up too. That you have this texture that's like a very flowy kind of texture. Oh, also you can take colored gels and just stick them between the flashlight. These are the flashlights over here. They go into the universal connector, which connects to the the actual thing. You can put a colored gel in here to change the color to whatever you want. So basically so, these these are like paint brushes almost. 
Exactly. They're paintbrushes for the dark. Yeah. Um, here uh, in this picture, this is uh, an example of the black fiber optic over here. So what I did was I simply had a flash and I exposed myself. And as soon as I exposed myself, I can now move around the image and I don't blur out. I don't I don't move. I, it's literally, it's now imprinted onto that image. So I stood up and I just swiped around my black fiber optic, which also had a little blue piece in there too. So that's why you got the white and the blue. Um, then over here, this, this girl over here, she's got wings. I literally just took the, the, the plexiglass over here and I put it on a, I put the flashlight on a strobe and I literally just painted like this and that created a wing looking effect. Uh, on the bottom left over here, you have a white fiber optic. Uh, you kind of just paint it like you would a normal paintbrush. Um, and then over here, she was outlined using actually the same tool over here as the wings. But instead, what you would do is you'd literally do, you outline yourself. Next big tool is L-Wire. This is probably one of my most fun tools to use. Uh, you can create things like smoke and water and fire and things that look like electricity. Uh, it's an interesting tool because you never have the same image twice. The wire is going to move in different directions and if you're swinging it or if you're like perfectly moving it, it's always going to look different, which gives it a nice interesting look um, and you can have different takes. But also it's one of those tools that take the most practice. If you want to really learn how to control it, you know, you, you figure out which, how you're going to grab it in every way you grab it is going to be different. Are you going to fold it first? Are you going to you know, make it look like spaghetti or, or are you going to straighten it and move it like that? So here's some examples of that. So you got your little smoke effect over here. You got your kind of electricity effect over here. You got power, fire over here. So, uh, Light wands and tubes. This, this is a fun one uh, because I create all my orbs with these, with these light wands and tubes. So it's an easy tool to create some interesting shapes and colors, uh, perfect for backgrounds or silhouettes. Um, I'll show you what that means in just a minute. Uh, the tubes are cheap plastic covering. So right here, all the way on the left, is literally just a plastic covering. You can buy them at most any hardware stores, and they you're supposed to put uh, like those fluorescent, uh, those long fluorescent bulbs in there. And uh, and then here you can see a flashlight, and it just illuminates the whole tube. Uh, you can use an LED stick. Even if you're not doing it, using it for light painting, you can use it to light your subject or your foreground. Over here uh, on the last, the last speaker we had was Savage and they, um, they make this stick over here. It's the LED light painting stick. And I love it. I, I'll show some examples later of, of what you can do with it. It's a, it's a great tool. You can change the color to whatever you want. You can change the brightness. Uh, it's very, the thing, with light painting that makes it so, that will make it easy for you, is if you have controllable lights. So if you can control the brightness or the temperature or the color on your actual device, it's a lot easier so you're not gonna have to go to your camera and change your settings there accordingly. Uh, lightsabers also work, but they don't have, but they only have one brightness which makes controlling it very, you know, controlling the, the exposure very difficult. Also, you have the chance of slicing off an arm or a leg. Um, yeah, don't, don't slice off an arm or a leg, but it's a very useful tool. We actually got a question already, so I'm yeah. gonna get this, squeeze this one in. 
Go uh, for it. Again, we, we don't have a time limit for this one because this is going to be the last one. So feel free to put in a question. We can go over time. We could talk crap all night long for all I care. Yeah, so, ask, ask away, everybody, that, and put your questions. So the question is, is how do you make the shadow image that you showed? Uh, I think it was two or three slides back. That one. This one. I'm actually going to get into this in full step-by-step -step detail later on, but the very short version of this is you're actually swapping lenses. So you take, um, what, what happens is, is she is standing the first, let's take the silhouette and that's position one and she in the, in the middle is position two. So she starts off in position one. She does this. And I take L wire and I rub it in back of her. So it's not actually exposing any part of her face. What it is, is it's literally making her into a silhouette. And then finally, when it's done, I'll cap, I'll cap the lens, which we'll talk about capping the lens later. You're not ending the exposure. It's not a double exposure, but you're capping the lens. So there's no light coming in. You can turn on a light. And at that point, she'll move into position two safely without tripping over a lot of things. You'll position your camera. And then finally, when she's ready, you take off, you, you turn off the light, you take off the lens, you insert a different lens on, you uncap that lens, and you continue the exposure by uh, creating position number two. Can I take it? Can we make this absolutely clear to everybody? This is not Photoshop. Right. No, this is completely in camera. It's pretty, it's, I would say, besides just a little con minor contrast, it's pretty much straight out of camera. All right, let's continue. Okay. Uh, so this is, this is uh, an idea of what you can, you can create with these light swords over here. Um, this is also created with the light sword. Now this is one a tube. I basically had my model stand on, on the lake and I grab a tube, I've got one right here. And you'll stand like this, you'll turn on the light and you'll literally just move it around. this work? Oh, what's your press? It's, uh, it's supposed to be a video. Oh. Huh. Did you set the play video? Technically a PDF. Here, I have an idea. Let's just play it through here. Yeah, right? Yeah, PDFs don't have videos. I just kind of learned that. Well, actually, there is a way to do it with the new version of um, Acrobat, but I'm not going to go into that. This is the wrong tutorial. Oh, sorry. So it's the making of my light angel. So what's happening here? is I'm outlining myself with a plexiglass tool that's turned on a strobe mode flashlight. Getting one leg. Getting the other leg. At that point, I can stand up and move around, creating wings. Take L wire and brush the floor. And that creates this.
All right. Where were we? I, I, I got to ask you this. Yeah. How do you visualize in your head where you are? That's that's where the real trick. That's that. I what I do personally is I see the image in my head. I I, I figure out what I want. I see it in my head of how I want it, and I literally trace over what I see. You kind of have to have a visual imagination. You, you don't have to. A, a lot of my paintings are literally just like, let's just grab some things and go. But for an image like that, that I thought about beforehand and figured out what I wanted, I had to see what it was. Also, if you're tracing yourself like that, it's all about knowing what you've already done. If you've already gone up one leg, you don't want to go up, you don't want to go down the same leg, you just go to the next part. Uh, real quick question from Richard Grace. Are you using an ND filter or are you using a light pollution filter for your Milky Way shots? No, with the neither. Light painting? neither. It's uh, I, I don't use any, any filters for any Milky Way shots. Uh, I've heard light pollution filters help but I just haven't used one. For me personally, if I can't see the Milky Way with my naked eye, I just, I don't bother shooting it. It's, there's, so there's, there's not much need, but I do, I do heard that they help. So there's a guy called XL or EX, sorry, XEL says he knows you. No. Oh. <laughs> Hi. All right. So exposing your shot. So I prefer to use a manual lens uh, so I can change the aperture at any time during the exposure to compensate for different lights or to expose different parts of the image. What this means is, is if I'm using different flashlights or different tools that illuminate differently, how do I get them to all expose in unison? A lot of it takes a lot of planning. So you have to know, okay, if I'm using this flashlight, which is very bright, for one tool, but want to use this flashlight for a different tool, which isn't as bright, how do I change that? So what I'll do is I'll, exp I'll turn the aperture down on the, I'll, I'll close it up. I'll paint with this tool and then I'll go over to my camera and I'll open it up a certain amount and then paint with this tool. So it's a lot of figuring out, and this is all within the same exposure. Capping the lens can help you uh, have the time that you need to be able to change tools or settings uh, mid exposure without ruining your shot. We'll go over capping the lens later. Uh, capping the lens before I, uh, the very simple version is, is you literally put the cap on the lens during your exposure. That way you can do whatever you want. It's still pitch black. There's no light coming through. There's nothing getting recorded. You can turn on lights, you can figure whatever you need out. And then finally, when you're ready to continue your shot, lights go down, everything's ready, uncap your lens. It's kind of in a way like a double exposure within a single exposure, if that makes sense. Um, it's smart to keep in mind that your brightest thing in an image will stick forever untouched uh, in your exposure. For example, if, you're light, if you light yourself with a flashlight and fully expose yourself, the, you will stay nicely exposed unless there's something behind you that is brighter. This allows you or your model to move around freely after being exposed with the light. Kind of like that self-portrait image I took uh, that I showed you in the previous one, I lit myself, I was nicely exposed, there was nothing behind me that was brighter than what I exposed myself in, and therefore no light could shine through. If there was something brighter back there, I would turn into more of a ghosty effect, and there would you would see what was behind me shining through me. So this helps a lot in being able to expose something in your image, but then move around and be able to do what you need to do. Uh, another... Let's do this again. Hey guys, we're out of Joshua Tree. 
I got my perfect model over here, Dom, and we are over here at, what was it called, Barker's Lake, or Barker's Dam, and uh, just past Blue Hour, this right here is a Gary Fong uh, light sphere on top of a flash, I have it set to manual, so when you push this button it flashes, I'm going to give this to her, she's going to get into position right over there, and I'm going to show you a little behind the scenes of a shot. So I'm using right now six seconds uh, F18 ISO 400. I might have to change it because this was this last time and it is getting darker pretty fast. Um, tell me when you're ready. All right. So on the count of three, we're gonna go one, two, three, and action. So she flashed it. Oh, there was a bat that just flew <laughs> right across my camera. And then, there we go. And that's a little behind the scenes of the shot. Okay. So that created that created this image over here. Now, obviously, I had to put my camera on a tracker and take the the Milky Way separately. Uh, taking your shots at blue hour is great because you don't have any harsh shadows. It looks like it's nighttime. It's easy to bring down, but also you have a good um, a good contrast between the sky and your foreground, which allows you to um, easily cut out your sky and replace it or blend it, I should say with the sky you took just shortly after. So yeah, this is, that was the making of that shot. Um, common questions I get on the topic is, uh, what do you do when you, when you want to expose for the night sky and your light painting in a single image? Well, uh, that is, that depends on a bunch of different things. You can either, uh, what, what happens I do a lot is sometimes I will use a very bright flashlight, which makes me take my f-stop down to, you know, f11, f18 or something like that. And I, I paint, I do what I need to do, but because the f-stop is so, so small and there's not much light coming in, the sky isn't getting exposed at all. And finally, when you're done with your light painting, you can turn you can turn the the manual ring and change your aperture to f 2.8 or whatever it is and just let it sit and expose for the sky um so that's that's one a number another way is let's see if i can find it right here so it's like i was telling you earlier is it's very it's good to have a light source that you can control so you don't have to go to your camera. So this is, you know, a flashlight, but you can also change its brightness by the ring on it. So let's, so you, you can put your, your flashlight on really dim and then paint accordingly and not have it blow out your image. Um, how do you mix the brightness of different flashlights and tools? It's the same thing. You just change your aperture ring as needed or change the, the brightness on the, the flashlight. But also you can, you can do things like, let's say if you have this and you have a t-shirt or whatnot, if, you, if this is too bright for your image, you can literally put it through a t-shirt and paint as so. You're just finding different ways to dim your light to balance out that exposure between your light painting and your um, and your night sky. Do you have a favorite flashlight? Uh, this one is one of my favorites. It's the Nightcore RSWI, and then this one is also my second favorite flashlight. It's the Eagle Tech DLC something LC two. Yeah, both of these are great flashlights. They're both dimmable. Uh, they both have a strobe mode, which is important for me. 
Uh, let's get into some fun, unique techniques. Is there any questions first? Um, well, apart from the person that's called XEL, it's the person's name is Levia. Oh, Leva. Leva, yeah. It's a good, um, good guy. I got a question actually, because you were mentioning the types of flashlights. Now, by comparison, there are so many flashlights out there. Yeah. What's the difference between the LED, the incandescent, and any other things that you can think of? I don't know, a candle. To be honest, that I have no clue. I, I literally, I, I have not the slightest clue on how any of that affects the image. I just kind of like, ooh, look, it's got, it's got colors. I'm gonna buy that one. So it's, I, things so are, you, the, yeah. You don't limit yourself then on a technicality then. You just basically pick up the damn thing and go, let's just see what this thing does. Exactly, yeah. Um, I do, like if I'm looking for something specific, then I've got kind of my my things that I would like. For example, I, I like dimmable flashlights. I like flashlights that have a constant strobe to it. I like ones that get either really bright or really dim. So it's not just dimmable, but it's also, um, you have that ability to go really, really dim or super bright. Um, uh, I like colors. Colors are always fun to play around with. Um, and also rechargeable batteries. That's a thing. Yeah, that, that always helps, doesn't it? In yeah, running around with a pack of double A's. <laughs> Yeah, when you're light painting all the time, you'll run through batteries like nobody's business. So, so yeah, those are some things that I look for in flashlights. But as far as you know, bulbs go, that I it doesn't matter to me. Have you noticed any differences though when you're doing it? Though I mean, I know fluorescent tubes that are gas filled will give a different. Uh, it's what they refer to as a CRI compared to say an incandescent bulb or an LED, which tends to be a very harsh point source of light. Yeah, um, I don't quite use, don't quite use those except for, except for the, the Savage light. This is, this is the Savage light, which is cool because it can change colors. Um, this, is so the LEDs. I'll see if I can if it's if I can turn it down enough. No, I can't. But the LEDs are different. There you go. So you actually see each LED. It's not just a steady light. But what I found with this to be able to make it a steady light is literally I just wrap it in um, cookie paper to create a. Uh, it's kind of like a diffuser. But other than that, I don't see a difference really in lights. Um, so I'll, now we're gonna learn the light man. Yay! This is the most fun thing because you can literally add a light person to any photograph on any kind of whatever it is. And I think they, they look great in um, landscapes, especially nighttime landscapes. It gives your picture a feel of, wow, this is a real place because this, you know, this background is a real background. This is an actual photograph, but then adds a little sense of mystery and supernatural and, and suspense to it. It's, it's a different kind of unique thing. Uh, so tools I use, I use finger lights. So these small little guys. And uh, what I do, the technique is you grab, you can do it with a flashlight too. My very first ones I did was with a flashlight. Um, and then I quickly went to finger lights, which are super cheap, by the way. You can get like 500 of these things for like 500, for like five bucks, super cheap. Um, so you basically grab it and you are painting yourself like this. You're going down. I always start at my feet and I'll go up one, one leg and then I'll go down the other leg and then I will turn it off and start at my waist and go up my waist to my neck. And after that point, I go down one arm, then you go down the other arm, finish at the neck, finish at the head and you're done. Uh, things to remember is to keep your light pointed away from you. 
uh, if your light hits your body, if you are pointing that light towards you like this, then yeah, you'll see the streak, but you'll also see yourself underneath it, which if that's what you're going for, then that's great. If that's not what you're going for, then point it outwards. And at that point, because the light's not hitting you, you will be invisible and you will only see the light man. Uh, keep it as tight as you can to your body. That will give your light man a lot better shape. Uh, I see it's a very common thing when people first start making light mans, they'll kind of go all, you know, they'll, they'll, they won't stick close to their face. They won't stick close to your body. And then you have kind of a weird, um, one arm is bigger than the other kind of thing. So just stick really close to your body, kind of trace yourself. So there's kind of a, go back and you can kind of see an example. Now for this image, uh, this was, I want to say something like a 20 minute exposure. Um, so what we did was, it was me and, and two others. And then all of our, our girlfriends were actually the ones manning the cameras. It was super fun. It was literally me painting my lady capping the cameras as need be. But what happened was, is we all drew a light person. And then finally, when we were done each drawing one light person each, someone would cover the lens. We would be able to turn on our lights and move to another location uh, without tripping on rocks because it's pitch black in this cave. And then we'd move to the next location. We would say, all right, we're good. We all turn off our lights. The people manning our cameras would take off the lens and we would continue and we do this a few more times until we have all the, the light people in there. Uh, energy orbs. Oh, um, sorry, real quick. Uh, go back to that picture for a minute. Big question here. How do you know how to expose for that cave? Because you just said it was a 20 minute exposure. Yeah. I mean, how did you know that 20 minutes would have given you that shot? Forget the light painting for a second, because obviously that's the additional part. But how did you know 20 minutes and what was the setting to get the exposure on that cave to even look like that? Because it looks like a really well exposed photo in general. That's a great question, Simon. And I would be glad to answer that. So, <laughs> all right. So believe it or not, when we were done exposing all the people the cave is still black in the exposure, completely black in the exposure. Um, because literally there was no light down there. This is miles underground. It's, there's rats running around, it's that dark. So um, what happens is when we were all done with drawing our light people, we cap the lens, we move back behind the camera and then when we will uncap our lenses and we'll take a flashlight and we'll literally light up. We will paint like not, not in one area, but we'll literally just do this and we'll paint the, the whole cave to illuminate the cave and give it its thing. Also, what that does is, is it illuminates the, the details behind the light people that you drew. If you look at the light person right here, if I never illuminated the cave under at, when I was done, you would not see behind it. If you look at the arm here, you can actually see the rock behind it. And that's because after I was done drawing these people, I took a flashlight, I illuminated the whole cave and that gave it more of a, see through look did that answer your question yeah totally i mean yeah. it's amazing that you you knew where to hit the light because even the shadows are like uh, are smooth and in almost in the right position almost like you fired a strobe forward i think the telltale sign for me is as further down in the cave we go the brighter it seems to get yeah um that was also the reason why that was is because when I was done with my part of the exposure, my last, my last person I drew was this red guy back here. So I was already back there. I was not about to come all the way to the front before the end of the exposure. I literally just hid behind a rock and I, 
I exposed the very back of the cave, which might have been better if I did it, but I did. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, it, it almost makes no difference if, if it was on purpose or not on purpose. It was just, it's the execution behind this that is the vital part. I mean, yeah. how many times did you try this shot? I'm assuming you did this once, though. Once. Yeah, and and that's the thing. It's just like, it's a, it's, it's a testament to your skill from an experience standpoint, which is basically what the long and short of it here is, but it's it's getting to that point, knowing what will happen when you run around and expose different areas. Yeah. And if you guys are, are somewhat familiar with Photoshop, the think of the aperture like a, uh, like the, the, what is it? Fill, the fill meter, not, not opacity, but fill, which means it only each. So if you are, if you take a flashlight and you're lighting the the foreground it's it do you want it to be one pass and it's great or would you like to literally take time and paint over it multiple times and each time you paint over it it comes a little bit brighter that's kind of how this is so if you use a a uh closed up aperture you can literally paint over the same area multiple times without blowing it out which definitely plays a good role in being able to paint your scenario. Uh, energy orbs, those are, these are one of my favorites uh, things to make because they, they can literally be so creative. There, there are, uh, I don't think I've ever created two of them that look exactly the same. So tools I use, you guys are gonna laugh, this is great. So I bought online an umbrella, a lightsaber umbrella. So this is it over here. And this piece over here literally used to pop up and turn into an umbrella. But I, I cut off the umbrella part. And now I just have the lightsaber. I don't think you can see it change colors or anything. But uh, something that really triggered me to get this was on the bottom. It actually has a, a little LED light. So the body, so I'll, I'll go through this. The technique is uh, body position is very important. You stand with your body to the side of the camera um, and your shoulders facing the camera. So let's say if this camera right here is where I am, I'm standing facing away from the camera pointing it here. Uh, you turn on the small light, this one, and at the end of the lightsaber with an outstretched arm, you start designing the outer shell. So you can see here the outer shell that contains your energy. Uh, when you're done, you turn the light off and you turn your saber around, turn on a color that you want your energy to be and paint with this paint within the circle that you just drew. Finally, create the inner orb. You do the same thing that you did with the first, with the, the, the outer orb, except for this time, you're just holding a finger light. So I'll demonstrate that really fast because I'm sure it's confusing. Let me move this camera. So you have your LED on. And what you do is you point it straight at the camera. And what I like to do is I like to go you, you make your squiggles, you make your, your, you can do circles if you want, you can do straight lines if you want, however you wanna make your outer orb, you make them, just make sure that your shoulder is always facing and everything rotates around that shoulder, which gives you your nice, perfect circle. Um, then when you're done creating the outer orb, you turn off this light, you turn this around, you push the button that turns on the light. I doubt you can see any light right now, but you, you paint within that circle, whatever color. And then finally, when you're done with that, you have a small LED in your hand and you literally just paint. So now you're not, it's not reaching out as far as this does. Now you're just painting an inner circle. And again, shoulder, same, same position. So everything, 
that you make is a perfect circle. I hope that made sense. Yeah, no, it made sense. I think what's gone and happened here is, is everyone's going to go, oh, so that's how they fake those uh, UFO pictures. Yeah, right. <laughs> Uh, some things that are very important is that your shoulder doesn't move the whole time. Uh, your shoulder acts as the pivot point of your orb uh, to create a perfect circle. If your shoulder moves, your orb will be deformed and all the kids will laugh at you. Uh, so yeah, keep that shoulder in the same place um, the whole time. It will probably get tired depending on how intricate you want your orb to be, but just hang in there. You, I believe in you. Uh, this is also one of those things that you should find out how your light is what to figure out what what ex exactly exposure do you want so for me personally I like to, to put it down to like f7 or so uh, that gives me a nice that that exposes from my light perfectly uh, get creative with textures of your orbs uh, you can choose squiggles, squares, circles, lines, or even cut your orbs in half, which I'll show you here. So here I've got my orb and it's cut in half with my light person inside of it. This is all a single exposure. You can see the Milky Way and everything. So you can see how long this light painting actually took. Um, over here, again, it's cut in half. You can see outside it's got the, this one I use circles. Um, and then you paint it with blue and then in the middle, you just, you just paint with uh, purple right here. It's this, I use the same technique that I did, but it, that I, I, I explained, but instead I actually put L wire on, on my tool, which gave it just made it into this nice smoke ball here. I'm using lines to create the outer orb. And then I, I didn't even create an inner orb. I just put, um, you know, light energy, plasma, whatever you want to call it, on the, in the center. Camera rotation. This one's a fun one. Uh, this one takes a lot of practice, um, but it does some cool things. So this, by the way, is a single exposure. So tools that you'll need. Uh, you need uh, two tripod L brackets and a panoramic head. Uh, I have one right here to show you and to show how it works. So here is the panorama head, this big part right here. And I have one L bracket and then another L bracket. And what this allows you to do is if this is on the tripod like this, you can now take your camera and turn it upside down if you see fit. Um, so the technique is first you have to plan out your, your shot. Um, sorry. All right. Plan out your shot and position your camera and tripod so that when you rotate your camera upside down, it isn't overlapping something you've already painted. Uh, this, this takes leveling your tripod. This has to figure out where your camera is in its rotation. Uh, they all play a big, a big factor. Uh, once you start your exposure, you paint your picture as you normally would a regular light painting. When you're done, you turn off your lights, you walk to your camera, you cap your lens, uh, then rotate your camera upside down. When you're ready, uncap the lens and draw the other half of your photo. You can use different colors like I did in this photo shown here, or the same colors, it's up to you. Uh, then end your exposure. So first, with this picture, I had, you, I had somebody stand on a pillar and I literally light painted him with, with fiber optics. I made this thing and then I've got lasers flying everywhere. And then finally, when I'm done, I cap the lens, I turn it upside down. So now this part that was on the top is now on the bottom. And, uh, and then I do the same exact thing, but with different colors for this part. 
uh, things to always remember is it's easier to have a friend with you to help cap your lens and rotate it. Uh, this leaves less chance for kicking or moving the camera as you're trying to cap it in pitch black. So I can't tell you how many times I've kicked my camera and knocked it over or like it's when you're working in pitch black, you're literally trying to feel everything, but at the same time, you don't want to move anything. So every touch, every move has to be very slow, has to be very precise. Um, so therefore, it's nice to have somebody to help you. I actually, I don't really cap a lens anymore. What I do is I have my, my black beanie and I literally just put the beanie on and it kind of just covers it. Uh, let's see if I can quickly show you how this works. All right. How do you deal with camera shake? How do I deal with camera shake? Yeah, so if you're in the middle of doing uh, an exposure while you're jacking around with that tripod in the background, um, how do you deal with the camera shake if you, if you have a lot of movement, especially, I mean, does it not affect anything? That's where that's where capping your lens comes into handy, because um, when your lens is capped, you can shake it or move your camera as much as you want, and nothing is exposing, so nothing is blurring. Um, now, if you so that's why I always recommend, even if you're just changing your aperture. I recommend capping it first because you can shake the camera a little bit. That being said, sometimes if I'm feeling lazy, I'll just kind of quickly do it and hope, hopefully nothing changes. So here, there we go. So I will start the exposure. I'll do my light painting. Sorry, I'll uncap this, start the exposure, do all my light painting. When I'm done, tap this, turn this around. So now it's upside down. Turn off my light, uncap it, move back, finish the light painting, end exposure. And this is something that you made or it's something that you bought that was already like this? Uh, I, I made this. This is. So it's made out of a tripod um, panorama head. So it's meant to, it's literally just meant to move your, your camera this way. But I use an extra L bracket to turn it from moving this way into this, I, I don't know. But I basically made it so that it rotates the camera upside down instead of just panning it left to right by cool. using an extra L bracket. Uh, also, something to keep in mind is you don't just have to do two angles like this. Um, you can try three or four, or even like if you just have a cool light of some sort, you can literally just rotate it, rotate it, rotate it, and make 10 different angles to create this cool geometric shape. I've seen some pretty cool things. So again, I'll go back to this one and you can kind of see an idea. This one, I didn't over, I, I overlapped the pictures a little bit, but yeah, this is, I, I went, I exposed him with blue, uh, painted all this, turned it upside down, did the same thing with red. This is a fun one. This is orientation camera tricking. Um, I don't know if it actually has a name, but I just called it that because it sounded cool. Um, so uh, how do I get this in a single exposure? So what you need is either an L bracket for your, for your camera or a ball head mount where you can turn your camera from portrait to landscape. So this was a very interesting photo. Um, and I'll go back to it in just a minute. It's all about tricking your camera's orientation. So you actually start this shot with the cap on the camera and start the exposure in landscape. Um, now, 
the camera is now the camera thinks it's in landscape. Then you turn your camera to portrait mode uh, and you mount it onto the tripod, you uncap the lens. And with a flashlight, you expose only your model. Make sure that you don't expose anything else who is standing on the ground looking up with his hands up in the air. So for this one, I was literally standing like this. Um, be very careful not to expose anything except for the model. Then draw your cape with a lightsaber. Um, cap your lens. Take your camera off and turn it back to portrait. Uh, turn it back from portrait to landscape. So um, now it's time to finish the exposure by uncapping your lens and blasting the foreground and background with light to expose everything else, giving the, uh, the illusion that I'm flying off the ground when you're done or stopping the exposure. So first started in landscape, then turned it to portrait, uncapped the lens, colored me in, drew the cape, turned it back into landscape, so now I am actually rotating in the picture. Um, also, the ground was here when it was in portrait. And, uh, and then exposed everything else. I got to ask you this. Yeah. Would it have been a d another way of doing it if you really did just jump off of a ledge and somebody fired the flash as you were in midair? That would have hurt really badly, but you're not <laughs> wrong. <laughs> you're not wrong. Uh, now I regret not just doing the stunt and putting the video in here for fun. Um, things to remember is keep in mind, keep, think about where you will be when you rotate the camera to better plan your shot. Keep in mind, you don't need to be in the same location for each step. You can take your picture of something or someone that you want floating, cap it and move the camera to a completely different place with a different foreground that you might like better. So let's say you're standing on a cliff or whatever, or you're standing somewhere and somewhere safe. You can do that same thing, but when you're finally exposing for your foreground or background, you can fire it off a cliff. And so it just looks like I'm flying a thousand feet up in the air. Uh, something to keep in mind is, how big am I compared to where, like you, you have to have that level of perspective. So if you want me to be, if you want someone to be flying further away in the distance, you can, you have to make them smaller. Uh, all right, so lens swapping and changing focal length. Do we have any questions to, to knock out? So I don't, we don't miss any? Uh... Oh, shit, I think I missed one here. It says, uh, have you tried using a diffuser on the flashlight and seeing if it changes the flare or the style of the light? Uh, I don't exactly. I've used a diffuser for my flash. Um, and this definitely changes, just changes the light. You get kind of a light bulb, as I showed in my example of the other one. Um, but as far as a flashlight goes, I do not. I do have a bunch of other lights that do have a diffuser on it, um, but those are mainly meant for just lighting the foreground evenly without any harsh light. And then uh, not a question, but Sama Hobeka, sorry to mess up your last name, says, uh, love your work, Mac. Oh, thank you. You're super sweet. Love you guys. All right, so lens swapping and changing focal lengths mid exposure. So how do you get something like this where it looks like it's Photoshopped, but it's not? <laughs> and like I said, I, I was gonna come back to this picture. So what you need here is you need two lenses or you can even use a zoom lens. I prefer to use two lenses mainly because Focus changes when you change your zoom, but because you're working in the dark, it's kind of hard. If you're using two lenses, you can already have both lenses per, you know, already pre-focused. 
So things you'll need to do is, uh, to, is plan your shot. Where is your smaller shot going to go within your bigger shot? Position one, uh, as would be shown here as the black silhouette, um, versus position two is the her inside. So I start the exposure with a 50 millimeter lens. My model is standing with her with her hands up. Uh, and I paint her with blue L wire in back of her, making sure that the light does not hit the front of her body to expose her face or any part of her body and leave her as a silhouette. Then it's also important at this point that you have a black background, it definitely helps. Um, then when that's done, I cap the lens. Uh, I turn on the light. I let my model move safely to uh, her, her next position. Uh, she sits in a stool, which is position two. So she's sitting down on a stool right here. Um, I uncap the lens. Oh, again, sorry, I missed a part. Um, I turn on the light, I let her move. And then I, when I turn off the light, I take off the 50 millimeter lens and replace this one with a 24 millimeter lens, which already has been pre-focused. I'll cap the lens and paint her with white L wire to create the smoke. This time I'm painting, I'm painting in front of her to let the, sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. Uh, I'm painting in front of her to let the light bleed onto her and expose her. Finally, I hide behind her. I reach over her chest to turn on the light bulb that's in the light bulb that's in her hands for a very split second to really create that ball and the illumination that it's going to give. And then I finally end the exposure. Just uh, to cut in real quick. Yeah. You've mentioned a lot about exposure, but I noticed you haven't talked much about aperture, especially for something like this. So the aperture for this one, for this one, the aperture changed the same. It was the same the whole time because I'm still using L wire. So it's the same tool that I'm using. If I change the aperture, then it would have uh, one thing would have been brighter than the other. So does the aperture or the aperture that you use, is it also critical? I mean, does it make a difference? Let's just say we shot with a 51.2 okay. and then you switched over to a 24 uh, and what's that going to be? It's a, a two, an F2. Did you make sure that you set everything to F2 or are you going, okay, I want to make yeah. sure this is nice and sharp and go F9? Yeah, I believe this shot was at F9, I believe, on both lenses. Does that when make sense? Do you, yeah, it does. Uh, when do you determine the effect for that? Because obviously, if I'm at F2.8 or anything below F2.8, my depth of field becomes incredibly shallow. Right. And as that light or the L wire moves further away, obviously it goes out of the plane of focus. Exactly. How do you determine? I mean, of course, it's a part of the effect, but how do you determine what you are expecting when you're doing that? I don't know if I'm articulating that correctly. Yeah. So um, that's that's another great part about when you're using a bright tool. Is a bright tool allows you to use a a uh, a, a smaller sorry not smaller a more closed down aperture, which gives you less depth of field. So if I'm using F9, it's either it was like, I think it was F9, F11 or something like somewhere in that range, you have a whole lot of room to deal with, to play around with where you're going to be in focus. But the main part of being in focus was that each lens was already focused to where I knew she was going to be. So when when I'm in position one, that lens is already focused to where she's here. I normally focus around where the ears are because that's kind of the halfway point between where her nose is going to be versus where I'm going to be in back of her. Even though you don't see anything here, I still want part of her, her fingers and everything to be somewhat in focus. And then the next lens, um, it's pre-focused to where she's going to be in this area over here. Um, 
and the app having a, a closed down aperture just helps me a little bit be able to always have her in focus without having to deal with depth of field. So with the technical people here, there are a lot of manual lenses that have markings on them. And as you turn the focus, it gives you this a bunch of numbers. I mean, I know what that means um, from a focal standpoint, regardless of what your f-stop is. Do you do, do you use any technical side of things when you're planning this? Because it, it, it this this seems like you cannot be overly technical almost. I try not to be overly technical. I I'm definitely the hippie kind of light painter that just likes to set up the shot and and just try it out, see how it goes, figure figure it out. But as far as like getting too technical, not not so much. I definitely do use Rokinon lenses. So I do have the ability to change the the aperture on it without having to go through the camera, which you can't do mid exposure. Um, but yeah, as far as like getting technical on numbers and stuff, not so much. I keep it loosey goosey. Cool. No, everyone does everything differently. I just um, it, it's a it's a huge curiosity because I've seen some other light painters who get overly technical. Um, when it comes down to that. I mean, they go as crazy as knowing how many aperture blades there are when you're closing down to say like F11, especially because those aperture blades become very apparent when you have a really good point source of light because of the diffraction that it creates. Yeah. Um, here's the thing is I always recommend that people know the technicalities. Unfortunately, I don't, but like um, I always recommend people know things so that if you needed to use that information or knowledge, you can do so. Um, I kind of just go in blind and, and I have my idea, I have what I, I want it to look like in the end. How do I make this happen? But Cool, um, all right, let's move on. Okay. Oh, another thing to, to think about here is when you're putting something inside of yourself or inside of another person, a person within a person, you have to make sure that what is behind your person is black or dark. If there were, let's say, if, if in that first position, there was a light somewhere here, it would shine through this person over here. Does that make sense? Cool. All right, fire and steel wool. Now we're getting in dangerous territory, Simon. Dangerous territory. I think this is the part that everyone's actually waiting for. Oh, God. Uh, hopefully, people are still around. Um, well, they are. So uh, this comes with a lot of safety. Um, I should disclaimer that I am not responsible for anyone's, uh, for anyone. Um, also, th there's a few ways to do this. This is just kind of my way to do it. So steel wool, this is steel wool over here. It's basically a cleaning tool. It's like, it's, how would you describe steel wool? It's like, yeah, I don't know. It's like one of those Brillo pads that you use to scrub your pan, pots and pans with, I guess. Exactly, you use it to, to, to take off grime and stuff like that. And you can buy them at any kind of department store. I actually took pictures and I decided to not, Put it in here because of time but i actually have it somewhere but so important safety tips never use fire around anything that's flammable this includes near homes in nature's parks anywhere around that there are trees that there are trees around all it takes is one spark to literally cause a fire and burn a lot of things down so please be careful if you decide to try this um, wear protective gear, a beanie to cover your hair, uh, long sleeves, uh, gloves, protective eyewear is always recommended. I always recommend you bring a friend. Two people are definitely safer than one. And also sometimes when you're kind of focusing on the shot or trying to like spin perfectly, you're not really aware of everything that's around you. So having another person there is definitely helpful. And also bring something like a fire blanket or an extinguisher just in case. 
Uh, tools I use, I use a cooking whisk, uh, grade steel, grade zero, zero, zero steel wool, uh, a lighter and a nine volt battery or a nine volt battery. Let's see, I, I should have it somewhere so I can show everyone what it looks like. Probably a good idea not to right now. <laughs> well, I mean, just, oh, here it is. Too late. Uh oh. So it's just a cooking whisk. Inside the cooking whisk, I, I have the steel wool and it's attached to a dog leash or you can attach a string. I like a dog leash because you can actually put it around your wrist and grab onto it if need be. Um, first, you attach your rope or a dog leash to the cooking whisk. Then you take a piece of steel wool out and you fluff it up. You want to take the, the, the steel wool because you want air to be able to flow through it. Um, you fluffen up your steel wool and you, you put it inside of the cooking whisk. Then you're ready. And then when you're ready and safe, you light, you light it with a lighter or you ignite it with a nine volt battery. So if you take your steel wool and you actually put a nine volt battery onto it, it will start to ignite. Um, after starting sparking, swing it above your head. And there you go, steel wool. Um, things to remember is practice swinging it a bunch of times before actually lighting it to get some practice in. The last thing you wanna do is you wanna be swinging it and because you're not good at swinging things, it will hit you and you can burn yourself. Uh, swing with your wrist. You don't wanna swing with your arm. What you wanna do is you wanna put it up and swing with your wrist. The reason for it is that is your pivot point. That is your swinging the, what, what's, the, what's the center of a radius called? Center of a circle? The center of a circle? Sure. Uh, I don't know the technical name for that. I failed at math miserably. So that will create a, a nice clean halo. Um, you can see here, it's kind of, an, this is one of my first ones, so it's not the cleanest, but right here, it's a nice clean halo. Uh, because it's only my wrist moving. If you start moving your arms, you'll start getting something like this where it's not as clean. Um, remember which pocket you put your battery in and which pocket you put your extra steel wool in. I've definitely made the mistake of putting the extra steel wool in a pocket that had the battery in it. And next thing you know, my pants are on fire and I'm driving home now with no pants. So definitely yeah you know what i honestly if you're going to do the steel wool trick i would prefer people to use the lighter method as opposed to the nine volt battery yep definitely. just purely because it is actually a lot safer uh incidentally the steel wool and the nine volt battery was developed as a survival technique to actually start fires, start fires in a survival yeah. uh, situation because people used to strip uh, phone batteries or any battery for that matter and just expose it and then put the steel wall in and go poof and then you've got yourself a nice little magic show exactly yeah no i i'm 100 behind that i personally use a lighter just because of that one time where i lit my pants on fire um so uh, <laughs> yeah don't don't so yeah I, I recommend a lighter but the nine volt battery does work and i say that only if you have a nine volt battery, but you don't have a lighter. Um, and now, you know, a nice little camping trick. Thanks, Simon. <laughs> yeah, well, thank Bear Grylls, not me. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, my camera sort settings normally start at about an eight second exposure at F8 at ISO 100. And then I kind of just adjust accordingly. That's a good kind of place to start. It's very, it's very bright and I believe back to that's what it looks like And that picture became that. 
That was the that was the final image of that of that video. Oh, um, um, before you just skip off there. Um, yeah. The different types of wool. Uh, I don't know if you've experimented with anything else other than steel. Is this possible to do with aluminum, copper? Uh, there's no such thing as magnesium wool, so I can't really say that one. Uh, so. I haven't tried other things besides steel wool, except I have put magnesium ribbon, little pieces of magnesium in the wool. I don't have a picture or else, like I haven't edited those yet. But um, what it does is while steel wool comes out as, as orange and red, magnesium actually comes out as blue. So what I'll do is I'll put like a very small piece, two or three small pieces of magnesium ribbon in there so when they're ready to burn they'll they'll turn into you know a nice good thing of blue and you'll just see blue sparks come out of the red it's actually kind of cool but i haven't used anything else besides steel wool and that little magnesium ribbon yeah copper is going to be a harder one to do because it's harder to ignite yeah i mean you almost have to have the reaction to begin with it you have to mix it with the steel wool in order for the copper to even be able to ignite but i mean the copper wiring or the copper anything has to be so incredibly thin because copper has a higher resistance that's why they use it to make electrical cabling yeah what color does does green it yeah really yeah greeny bluish color i mean i'm down to give i'm down to give it a shot the thing that's safe about steel wool is normally as soon as it hits the ground it's normally out that being said don't ever assume it's going to be out um that's why you don't want to you, you don't want to do it near anything that can catch on fire but that being said most of the time once it hits the ground it will bounce once and it's out it so as, cr as crazy as this sounds um is there actually an alternative we can use? I mean, you mentioned at the very beginning that buying those little finger LEDs, you said you get 500 for like five bucks. Yeah. Have you ever put a bunch in a bag and then, you know, purposely put a hole in there and then tried the same thing? I mean, uh, it's going to make a mess, but who cares? Yeah. Uh, I haven't because, yeah, it would be a mess. It's also, I would count that as littering. <laughs> well you have to pick them up at least you can see them yeah um well assuming that the that the light is still good afterwards they're they're super fragile like they you can literally squeeze it too hard and they're gonna break um but uh i haven't used anything else um i would be interested in trying other things i, I think we should i think we should make a day out of that where we we get some of these things put them in a clear plastic bag with a hole in them that are big enough to allow them to disperse and just try it. I mean, I'm this, done. this sounds like a safer alternative to steel wool, especially um, I'm, I'm not promoting that anybody does this type of uh, thing unless it's under a good controlled environment. And of course, um, kids, please do not do this at home, but the, the finger LED lights might be an, an alternative. Yeah, no, definitely. I, uh, I don't think that's a bad idea, and I would be so down to meet up with you and give it a shot. So Michelle Locke actually says, I put finger lights in a balloon whisk, and it came out great. Finger lights in a blue whisk? Yeah, or in a balloon whisk. I don't know what yeah. a balloon whisk is. Michelle, by the way, is a great light painter. She is absolutely fantastic at what she does. Hey, man, she, she said she's done it, so she's got one up on you. We need to one up her now. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, one picture, I, I might be wrong, but I think she was part of this shot right here. Yeah. I'm sure she's going to say something any second now on the live stream when it catches yeah, let, the hub. Let me, yeah, let me know, because she was she's so fun to play around with. So um, do you want to continue on the fire? We've got 10 shots left. Oh, hold on one second. That was... So we live in California, um, so we can have earthquakes here, and we just had one. Oh, really? Yeah. 
oh, sorry. I was unsettling because everything just like went and shook for a second. I was like, ooh. We had a good one the other day too. Yeah, no, that's not fun. Welcome to California. Exactly. All right, sorry, moving on. So next is a little bit, we're going we're gonna to kick up the heat a little bit and talk about some fire. Um, this one comes with a lot more strict rules and regulations to follow. So yeah, this is just fire and, and, and yes, actual fire, not imitated fire. So, okay, there's important safety tips and I can't not go over them. So, um, let's, let's get the, get the boring stuff out of the way. Um, boring, but very important. So pyrophotography requires you to be on high alert and always paying attention. No matter how much you think you know fire, it's always unpredictable. And also, you must be ready for any situation. Before I dive into the prep and technique, I need to share some safety tips with everybody. Um, first, thing, first thing you should always do is have a conversation with your model let them know exactly what's going to happen step by step. Go over all the safety precautions. Make sure that you're comfortable with everything, that they're comfortable with everything, and that everybody is on the same page. Communication keeps people safe. Um, there was a thing that went viral just recently that someone tried to do fire photography, did not have any kind of conversation with their model. Next thing you know, their model is in hospital. So. Um, again, follow all of the, if you follow all of these tips, you will be so much safer. Everything will be good. Everybody will be on the same page and it, you'll have, you'll have a lot better of a time and probably come out with a lot better images. Um, to never do fire photography near homes, residential areas, or any sort of nature. All it takes is one ember to burn down a forest or home. Um, yeah. Just, just don't do it. It's not worth it. It's not smart. And normally it's pretty crappy as a background too. Um, always, always have safety precautions. This means having a flame retardant blanket, a fire extinguisher, stand, sand, um, shooting in a large body of water is also a safety precaution. So anything that allows you to be able to put out whatever you need fast. And I'll actually show you guys a video of, of of putting something out. Um, having at least one assistant for two reasons. One, they help click the shutter button. The last thing you want to be doing is fiddling around with a button with your hand that's pretty much holding fire. <laughs> um, uh, and also as an extra set of eyes and, you know, enhanced to make sure that everything is safe. Like I was mentioning with steel wool, uh, you are so focused on your shot, you're focused on your safety of, of the situation that um, you are not looking everywhere. An ember could have flown off somewhere and therefore it's always good to have another person. In fact, I do not recommend ever doing fire photography by yourself without an assistant. Um, both you and your assistant should keep an eye on your model and the flames at all times, be aware of loose embers. Uh, do not pour fuel on your already lit flame. I sad I have to say this, but again, there was another situation where the flame was starting to go out and someone poured, you know, lighter fluid on it. And next thing you know, he, he's, he's on fire. So yeah, don't do that. Uh, do not wear synthetic fiber clothes. Uh, cotton is slightly less flammable, um, but also safer for your body. And if a skin, if an ember touches it, synthetic fibers will actually melt to your skin. And you don't want that. That would be bad. Um, uh, wear protective clothing. I always recommend, I always wear a beanie to protect my hair because let's be real, no one wants to mess with this dude. Look how beautiful this looks. Oh yeah, look at that man. Um, you know, I gotta say something. Every time I see a picture, uh, like one of the pro photos, you've got like the coolest hair on the planet. <laughs> it's all, a, it, it does what it needs, it does what it does. Um, I always recommend long pants, a long sleeve t-shirt, protective eyewear. So, yeah. 
The other thing that I should mention here is, um, uh, this is again more for safety, fire extinguishers, do not bring the chemical versions of them, yes. okay? Because nope. they do not have a good range. The best fire extinguishers sold anywhere in the world has always and always will be CO2 by a long shot. Yeah, I um, and also you need to know what fire extinguisher you needing for what. There are fire extinguishers for for oils, fire for there's different fire extinguishers for different things. So make sure you get the right one. Right. So for those guys who are interested in this and, and you do want to conduct this safely, uh, the fire extinguishers are chemical, water, CO2 and foam. And they're always color coded and anywhere around the world has their own unique color codings. Uh, in the United Kingdom, water generally is the red fire extinguisher. For us, chemical is the beige color, although here in the US, the red is also the chemical. Black is always CO2 and green is normally foam. Uh, foam is great on things like oil fires and things like that. Uh, CO2 doesn't tend to work on it very well because it just ends up blowing the fire around. Uh, but electrical fires, CO2 is by far and wide the best. Putting out steel wool, CO2 is obviously the best on that. The chemical versions of those are, tend to be wood fires and things like that. So again, plan accordingly, but just remember chemical fires make a mess like you wouldn't believe it and it's really obvious that you were there yeah no definitely and uh i want to i want to also add another safety tip here is um don't stand close to your your model for all of these photos for all of these photos it might look like i'm standing right in front of them or right in back of them but i'm actually pretty far not pretty far, but like a good three, four steps back. So, you know, keep a good distance. So the tools I use, uh, I use a wooden dowel with, and I need a heavy staple gun, uh, a 100% cotton white t-shirt. Uh, you can use different colors, but it will actually change the color of your flame. So that can actually look kind of cool. I've tried it with blues, I've tried it with reds. I personally don't like the color. I think white actually does work the best. Uh, lighter fluid um, and then Kevlar thread. I have an example right here. It's coming apart at the moment. But what, hap what you do is you take your white t-shirt and you wrap it up on your wooden dowel. And you want a good, you want a good distance from the end of the dowel to where it actually starts because this will actually be the part that's on fire. So you wrap it up and then what you do is you take Kevlar thread and you literally wrap it in Kevlar thread because what Kevlar thread will do is it actually, it won't burn. It won't, well, it will burn, but it won't break. So it will keep your t-shirt attached to your, your dowel longer. And the last thing you want is for your t-shirt to come off and start waving around everywhere where it's on fire, uncontrollable. So. Yeah, that definitely helps. And then even to do it more, I don't know if you can tell, but I've got staples in the whole thing that literally keep it down. So um, that is, so t-shirt, wrap it around the, the, the dowel, wrap uh, Kevlar thread around it, staple it down. Make sure it's nice and secure. Uh, make sure that there's no pieces kind of coming apart the less the less pieces you have flapping off of it the more embers you're going to have which is not always a good thing um so i pretty much went over the technique uh finally uh waving around grab your lighter fluid and soak it soak it the soak your this is what now is a torch uh soak the torch and then move the bottle far away. You don't want to light your torch with your bottle right next to you. If an ember comes off and hits that bottle, it will explode. Um, then, uh, yeah, move your bottle far away, then light your torch and start waving. Have your assistant manning your camera. Uh, when your flame is almost out, put it out. 
don't make sure that it's completely dead before checking your pictures. That is so important because you don't want to put your your torch down somewhere and next thing you know you get a little breeze that ex that starts really igniting a piece and an ember flies off. So make sure that your thing is completely out before doing anything else. You usually have a bucket with water in it, don't you, that you just throw the thing into? I, you can, yeah, I, I've done that for sure. Um, I actually like having a fire extinguisher and a flame retardant blanket. So I will first fire extinguish it down and then I will literally wrap it in a, in a blanket. And that will that will get rid of it. Um, but I definitely have had the bucket before. The bucket does work. Um, uh, things, but then you have to bring like if you if you're going on a location and whatnot, you do have to bring a bucket with uh, a, enough water in it to fill. You know the whole thing. Uh, practice swinging it before lighting it to get some practice in. Uh, have your assistant count on your exposure. Uh, th what this means is I have whoever has the button. Oh, by the way, I have something I should have mentioned in the very beginning is all this really helps if you have a, a remote trigger. So I actually have a remote trigger. If I'm wearing gloves, I keep it in the glove. So it's always there. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll attach like a string to it. So it's kind of hanging as a necklace so I always know where it is at all times and I can literally start and stop the exposure at all times. For fire photography the last thing like I said you want to do is be fiddling with a button or, or dealing with anything else besides the safety and the shot of your photographer of your of your model. So give this to somebody else and what I have them do is I have them count one two three go and then the two I, I do two second exposures one, two. And then once that's done and the picture pops up, it should go one, two, three, boom. Exposure ends, one, two, three, boom. So, and that just keeps going. You want to knock as many pictures as you want out um, before the fire is dead. So uh, my camera settings are normally start around two seconds, F11, um, ISO 100. And then as the flame gets dimmer, you'll, you'll need to adjust your settings. Just keep opening up your aperture as the flame starts to die. I like to always try and keep the ISO at 100 if I can. Uh, longer than two seconds can sometimes get um, a, little, a little too much. Two seconds is a long time when you're waving around a, a, a fire stick. Also, um, speed is your friend. You can't let the, the fire stay too long in one spot. It will blow it out so fast. So you really want to move it around, but also be safe. Um, I believe. Yeah. So let me go back to another video. Also having a countdown helps the model know when the picture is gonna take. So she's got three seconds to change her pose. And when you start seeing a lot of embers come off, like you're starting to see here, it's, Time to start put start putting it out. Oh, there's the bucket. There you go. It's fire extinguisher time. Uh, where was I? Where's my, where's my thing? It's yeah. behind it. 
This is also a keynote. Oh, uh, I don't know. Oh, there it is. Like a painting presentation. Maybe, maybe not. Eh, this is fine. And then that's the picture that came out of it. Uh, and then I figured I'll just touch on some, first off, do any of you guys have any questions about Fire or Pyro before I just move on to the last few little fun, really quick ideas? Well, I think we scared everybody from uh, doing it. <laughs> oh, really? No, yeah, there's, there's no questions on that side of things. Okay. Um, some other really fun ideas is you can use lasers. Um, to use lasers, you also have to have a way of um, creating an atmosphere to project your lasers. So for this, I used um, I used a, a smoke bomb to help create the the atmosphere. Uh, you can actually paint things with colors. So here, I just have a flashlight, and I. Uh, put colored gels in the flashlight to color it yellow and then I did another one with with red with a red gel and colored the eyes. This is a single exposure. This one is actually done with the Savage light stick. Um, it's but you can you the cool thing about this light is you can change its light and then also um, program it in the app to change colors or fade from one color to another. So for this one, I literally just had the glasses and the contacts on a chair and I literally put the thing and went done. But you can create some, some interesting things like that. Uh, you can make different kinds of orbs from the one on the left, which is more of a swinging orb. You put an LED on a string and you're literally just swinging it and rotating around. What I like to do is I like to put something on the ground like a coin and you rotate your you rotate around it, making sure that once your swing goes around, your swing is always, the, the LED is always going over that coin and you're just rotating around it. So that way you have a nice clean circle. And then on the right is just a flash with a, Gary Fonk sphere, and what you do is you just manually push the button and it will illuminate, which gives you a nice little ball. And then that's it. So we're into QA finally. Yeah, took long enough, right? Well, Told I, you mean, what, I mean, Told you to be honest, I mean, well, yeah, we're only a little bit over by an hour, but that's all right. So I don't know how many questions that are going to come pouring through. We're just going to let that part catch up uh, in just a moment. But uh, I have a handful of questions right off the bat. Sure. Um, Go for it. Type of camera. Um, you haven't even mentioned, uh, and I, I kind of feel like it's whatever you're comfortable with. But what is the what is your favorite camera that you like to use to do this kind of stuff? Uh, I def I use a Canon 60, a full frame camera, uh, I definitely will be um, jumping over to the Canon R5 game as soon as that comes out. But as of now, I have a Canon 60. It's de definitely been my workhorse camera for a few years now. I mean, do you find that the camera that you use makes any difference? I mean, every camera has its ups and downs. No. And is it a thing? I mean, just like when we do astrophotography, some cameras perform better than others. Uh, yeah. It's a yes and a no. The 6D, the reason I chose that specific camera is because it's good in low light. It's known to be really good at low light. And I've seen a huge difference between that camera and others when it comes to low light. That being said, I can, I, I honestly feel that I could, create the images that I create with any camera. Like I don't I don't think that gear is the the stoppable force from creating a good image, even if it's like at nighttime or in low light or whatever. You just you have to figure out how you do what you do and 
Yeah. Um, is is there? Oh, did you freeze there? No, you didn't. Is there a preference on? <laughs> Is there a preference on the type of lights that you like to use? Um, I mean, I know each type of bulb has its own unique effect. Uh, you showed two flashlights, but there are other things that you haven't even touched on that I've seen you use before in the past. Yeah. Um, as far as light sources go? Yeah. So um, I the, the Savage light um i recently acquired and that has been pretty fun when it comes to lighting uh it definitely is useful when it comes to lighting foregrounds or uh or your people and stuff like that i haven't used it too much yet when it comes to actual light painting besides the picture that i showed earlier um so that's definitely good and i have another version where it's just like a small little LED light. As far as light sources go, lasers, like I mentioned, are, are, are a great tool. If you put either a, a small little diamond on the end, or actually you can buy lasers that have what they call star, uh, star or something like that, where it diffracts the light. That's how I got one of the, the pictures before. Um, this is a really cool flashlight and I'll show you why. Most flashlights, when you turn them on, you have kind of, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it. Oh, no, I see it. I totally right. see it. But like it, it, it bleeds out. So it, the, the light just bleeds. But if you have the camera, you have that nice, perfect circle. Does that come out? Yeah, oh yeah, totally. Yeah, so you can, you can paint, let's say if you just want to make dots, you just on and off, on and off, on and off. Now you have dots that you can create. Or let's say if you want to write, if you want to do graffiti, but light graffiti, now you have a nice light to be able to literally draw the thing that you want to be able to create on a wall or whatever it may be. Um, a nice thing about a light like this that doesn't bleed is Let's say you're finished with your light painting and you want to draw stars everywhere. You literally hold it to the lens, you turn it on and off, on and off, and now you're creating stars with the diffractions. Um, as far as lights go, that's kind of it. It's kind of basic flashlights, but all have different features to them that I enjoy. Um. Light painting is not limited to the movement of the light. Uh, I've done this before myself. In fact, actually, I remember when me and you were out in downtown LA where yeah. the camera moved. Yeah, you move your camera, and that, that still counts as light painting. So go, do you want to go into some of the premise behind that? Because now only the point source of light technically becomes visible. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I'm not too versed in it. Literally, that was probably one of the first times I, I, I tried something like that with you. Um, but there's actually a name for it. Um, what's what's the, the, the opposite of static? So like when you put it on a camera, it's, it's static light painting. But um, there's, a, there's a name for that when you're actually moving the camera around instead of the light. The light is the thing that stays constant. Yeah, I mean, I've definitely experimented with that with like neon signs and things like that, where I've made the camera pan left to right just to give a basic, basic movement. A nice um, Yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually enjoy doing cityscapes and waiting for the cars to come whizzing past. And, and I always get these fantastic um, images that come from that. Yeah. Uh that was fun when we were out in, in downtown trying to move, try and pan your, your, your camera with a long exposure at the same rate, trying to lock onto the cars. So, um, who's this? AE Myth says, no, I'm too late. You can replay the stream. Don't worry. Don't panic. <laughs> it's two hours of craziness. Yeah, it has been. Oh, do you want to end your screen share? Because uh, I don't know if it's not splitting back between you and me. 
Uh, I don't think people really want to see my ugly head anyway, so it's not a problem. Oh, you just remember. basically stop the screen share. How do you do that? Uh, end screen share on Zoom. There's but don't new... exit the meeting, otherwise this gets cut off. There's new share, pause share. Uh, um, maybe if I just do... Oh, I don't have that control over that, I think. I think we could just pause pause the share. Stop share. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Oh, nice. Okay, cool. All right, so now people can see both me and you at the same time. Like I said, I don't know why anybody wants to see me anyway. You're a um, fella. Well, it, it's just so it's not a disembodied voice, um, just like booming over this. So um, detracting... Oh, it's just uh, everyone's talking to each other now. That's great. Um, so detracting from what we're doing slightly, I know you got into astrophotography and it's it's not new to you because it, it kind of lends itself with some of the photography you're doing, especially with the nightscape stuff. But you only just recently, within the last two years, three years, got into all of this. What has been the biggest eye-opening thing and how do you cross that line between your regular photography, your light painting, and the astrophotography? So uh, I'll answer that question and I'll bring it back just a little bit further. Is when I when I first met Chris and at that concert, I had no idea that you can take pictures of the Milky Way with a regular camera. I had seen Milky Way pictures before, but I was under the impression that that is heavy duty gear, not a DSLR. So in my, in my search for my first camera, which was a Canon 60D, um, I found a guy by Mark, his name is Mark G. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've seen him before. He came out with a very famous photo called uh, Full Moon Silhouettes. And um, anyways, he's a Milky Way photographer. And when I found out that he is doing this with a regular DSLR, I was like, okay, this is definitely something. So I bought the DSLR, started doing my thing. And to answer your question, it was because I had found out that you can do that. I went out to Joshua Tree. I took a picture of the night sky and I was so excited. I took a 30 second picture and I look up and all of a sudden, nothing. I was so upset. And I was pointing it there, 30 seconds, nothing, 30 seconds, nothing. And, um, and it was because it was November and there's no Milky Way in November. Well, it's, we're looking at the wrong part of it, put it that yeah, way. Yeah, you're, you're looking at the tail end of it. Yeah. But it wasn't what I saw in pictures. So, um, you know, I try, I went back um, in May the next year, it was May in 2017. And uh, I went with a few friends and I planned out the shot and I ended up taking my very first real Milky Way shot and that was it. I was hooked. I, I looked at my camera. I saw the Milky Way. I was standing there with a light and whatnot, you know, and uh, I, uh, I, I just asked when I knew this is what I wanted to do. This is where my life is heading and the, my new obsession. So um, you, you're turning into like a, a telescope junkie almost. I mean, you did you do a lot of music, hence all the guitars in the background. And the irony behind it here is, is you're probably going to have another part of the wall in your bedroom dedicated to just the telescopes. <laughs> uh oh, and there it is. <laughs> yeah, all all three of them right there. So. Um, I'm going to take this like small opportunity on uh, on talking about a project that me and you are going to do. I, I understand that there is this quarantine thing here, but you know where we're going to be going, there is going to be nobody around us. It's just me and you, and maybe one other person, and we're going to be six feet apart. You know, safety first at the end of the day. Um, but 
we're going to be doing something very specific with the sun. So you've done an ISS capture with me before already with the moon, but you've never done it with the sun before. No. I almost want to know because I remember my first time and planning this. I mean, the, the only difference here is, is I've done the homework for you, but give me a quick rundown of what your thought is going to be. I mean, what are you going to visualize? Um, I would assume that it's the same. It's roughly the same as taking a picture, but you're just taking a way longer picture. So, um, for anyone that doesn't know, to take an image of the sun, you take a bunch of frames. Uh, it's almost like you're taking a video. You're taking a video of the sun, taking those frames, ch chopping up to single frames, stacking them up off on top of each other. It's more complicated, but that's the basic. And um, I would assume that it's this, you know, the setup is the same, the focus is the same. Um, I, I'm probably completely wrong. But this is just to answer your question, what I think. And then uh, I would just, you know, take a lot longer of a video to, to be able to have that. I'm actually intrigued to see how you get along with this one, because um, there's two ways. Well, there's more than one way to do any type of solar imaging. Uh, again, don't ever point your telescope at the sun without the correct protection. We're going to be shooting specifically something with uh, hydrogen alpha, which is what the gold and black colored scope that you probably just saw just a second ago. That's the Solar Max. Uh, I'm going to be using a quark. Uh, I still haven't decided which scope I'm going to bring yet. It depends on the seeing condition. It's either the 100 or the 150 Esprit. I don't know which one I'm going to use yet. So it's I'm, I'm still scratching my head about which one I'm going to bring. But between the two, it's going to be an interesting shot, but hydrogen alpha is going to give a very, very different look. And you've been practicing profusely with all of this. Yeah, I've literally been out every day except for today because I had this, but I'm, I'm practicing. I'm trying to get it down. I want to be good. And then I want this. I want this. I, I, I want this shot to be good. So there is a, uh, a question here. It says, um, you said you have an app that's a Milky Way tracker, or if you have one that's a Milky Way, which one is it? So it's called Photo Pills. Um, Photo Pills allows you to, it, it's a few things. Um, I use Photo Pills to plan out my Milky Way shots. So what it does is, let's see if I can find it really fast. So it's got a thing on it where you can actually see I don't know if you guys can see this. Ah, forget it. It's a see-through mode. So you can see what your camera is seeing through the camera, but also you can see where the Milky Way is at whatever time you want. So uh, let's say you're going out to Joshua Tree and you see these nice rocks and you want to use those rocks in a Milky Way shot, but you don't exactly know what time the Milky Way is going to perfectly align with those with those shots, you can use photo pills to point it at those rocks. Say you want the Milky Way to be right here, or you can just scroll to, to, to scroll the timeline and uh, and plan it out that way. I also use an app called Stellarium, which helps kind of plan where everything in the sky is going to be at any time. Cool. So yeah, if you guys have any questions, feel free to fire them off. We're probably going to stay live for probably just at like uh, another 10, 15 minutes tops because I think uh, between the pair of us, we're probably dying to go get something to eat at some point. <laughs> Good old Turkish sandwich. Yeah, I've, I've been at this since 12 o'clock this morning, so I haven't really stopped. <laughs> um, oh, the book. I forgot. We never talked about the book. Yeah. So the book, uh, I've got a book coming out, guys. It's called uh, Secrets from the Stars. You can find it on deepskycolors.com and then click on books. Um, if you, uh, it's pretty much everything that I talked about today and so much more and so much more in details with more pictures and everything. And then, uh, yeah, so I, if you guys want to support, I would very much be appreciative of it. Um, 
if you send me a photo with you and your book, I will send you guys a video tutorial of everything that's that I talked about here. Um, yeah, everything step by step, actually showing you how everything is done. So, cool. Yeah, it's, and who did you co-author the book with? That's more important. Yeah, right. It's how? Yeah, his name is Rogelio. Um, he is. Uh, I call him Astro Daddy. <laughs> but he is literally is like the godfather of of astro astrophotography. His work is so beyond amazing, and literally, he just he gets more a pods than anybody else I know. I think he actually holds the record right now with the most amount of a pods. I mean, I'm not giving the a pods when it's like say a NASA photo. I'm talking from uh, somebody who's a member of the public. I think he has the most. Yeah. He actually, um, while you did sell me my first scope and sell me on the idea of the first scope, he definitely pointed me to that direction. And um, he was the guy that I went to for all the advice, what camera to get, all this, that, and the other. I think between you and Rogelio, you guys have definitely been the 75% of where I got all my information from and then everybody else vast reaches uh Jason and um Anthony a bunch of other people countless amounts of people probably <laughs> yeah I've I've reached out to everybody and that's the thing too and and I recommend I recommend to everybody out there that wants to get into the, the hobby or or just photography in general to like first figure out what you want to do to do your own research um go out go on 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 you youtube is the most amazing thing on the face of the planet you can you can learn so much from youtube and then there's vlogs and and whatever you know there's so much information out there do your own research kind of narrow it in and then if you have any questions with anything or like you need advice on on something don't be afraid to reach out to people i myself you guys are more, anyone is more than welcome at any time to reach out to me i respond to everybody on instagram and yes that's like 250 some odd people a day um so i i want to be here to help anyone to to push them along on this journey and most photographers are down to do that too. But also that comes with do your own research first, you know, have an idea of what you want. If you just come up to me and say, I want to take pictures, I'm just going to be like, okay, go take pictures. But if you go like, hey, like I'm thinking between this camera and this camera, this is what I want to do. Like you've kind of narrowed it down. You've done a little bit of your own research. I can definitely help you really kind of figure out which way would be better for you. So. Yeah, I think that's that's probably some of the best advice right there is um, working at the store, I get this on a regular basis, is people just say, I want to be this, or I want to do astrophotography, or whatever the case may be, but they don't research the, the camera, the telescope, or any of that stuff, so they're not overly familiar with any of these aspects of this. And it's, it's actually really frustrating for myself without going into a rant that there are too many telescopes out there and it's picking the right one to serve that purpose. And it helps if the end user is, is the one that is a part of that process. So he can come up to me and go, yeah. I wanna do Milky Way shots. Well, okay, great. It's not a telescope you want. You, you probably wanna get away with a regular camera lens and things like that. Right. But then when they say, I want to take pictures of nebulas and, and all that kind of crazy stuff, then we can start getting into it. Because the, the, the telescope I would sell you for doing planets is not the telescope I would sell you for doing nebulas. Exactly. Like we want to we want to be there to help you. We don't want to do it for you. We don't want to do all the research and stuff. I don't mind going online and helping finding a good deal for someone or like, you know, comparing specs for someone like i don't mind doing that as long as you've done your research to like the best of your abilities and i 
astrophotography, especially deep space astrophotography, is such a technical hobby. There are so many things that you will not understand in the beginning. There's numbers, all these things. I remember the first time I walked into your store, <laughs> literally you were busting out like math numbers and calculations and things. I was like, you know what the funny thing was though? I genuinely thought that you had already done that because you had that premise that you had the right question. So my assumption was that you had already figured that stuff out. I did not. I, here's the thing is I didn't figure it out, but I knew what you were talking about. I had done enough research that what you were saying was not alien to me. It just no pun intended. Was, yeah. It just was new information that I did not know, but I understood it because I knew enough about the hobby. So, but yeah, it was, uh, it just, it was a whole different thing because I had done the research. Had I not done the research, all that information that you had told me, I, I, I would have not known what, what to do with it. So do your own research make make our lives easier but at the same time don't be afraid to reach out ask us questions we would be glad to help we want to know and then do something we do something with the information we give you that to me is is everything if i tell you hey like you come up to me which telescope should i buy which camera should i buy how do i shoot this nebula like what what is it and i give you all and i spend my time to like write you out this nice thing I want to hope that you're going to do it. Like, you know, don't make it for nothing. I mean, I get it if you just want to know. Like, that's fine too. But if you come up with an with a nebula picture now with with gear that I might have recommend, that to me literally means everything. Yeah, it means I was part and I actually did help in some way, shape, or form. So, how do people find you before we uh, finish this? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at at Mac Murdoch, which is that right there. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just at Mac Murdoch, M-A-C-K-M-U-R-D-O-C -C, um, on Instagram. Excellent. All right, guys, we are going to finish this. This has been one heck of a slog. Um, we are over by one hour and I am very impressed that you guys have stuck through us through, through this entire thing. Um, we're going to be back again on May 2nd to do Astronomy Day. Um, it is actually International Astronomy Day on May 2nd, so we're going to have all sorts of astro-related stuff for you. This particular video or this particular live session was more photography geared. I understand that some of you probably were expecting uh, astrophotography stuff, but we're trying to mix it up a little bit here for the two different crowds. So again, I appreciate Mac being involved in this. Uh, I want to thank uh, Susie from Savage. I want to thank uh, Roger from Nisi Filters. And of course, Michael from Fuji Film for making this thing happen. And you, of course, the audience for watching this. And we will hopefully see you sometime next week. Any last words? No, I'm good. You're good. All right, then. Let's get the heck out of it because I'm hungry.